Woke up quick at about noon. What a tremendous start to NBA free agency, not even 24 hours in, depending on when you're listening to this, and just a shade under $3 billion spent. We'll do our best to recap it all here. Welcome into the podcast with Damian Barling, presented by Vibe Health Bar, Sacramento's premier superfood cafe with locations in East Sacramento, Oak Park, and Folsom. Vibe Health Bar is where busy people go to achieve vibrant health. For more information, stalk us at Vibe Health Bar. You can stalk me on Instagram and Twitter at Damien Barling. Search Damien Barling on Facebook. Hit the like button there. And welcome in to all of the subscribers. If you're new to the show, appreciate you being here. Hope you dig what you're listening to. You can hit the subscribe button. If you really dig what you're listening to, make sure you hit the five-star review is there as well. And if you have a an extra couple of minutes, another minute or two. It only takes a split second to to hit the five stars, but if you have another minute or two, leave us a review, particularly there over on Apple Podcasts as well as this podcast continues to climb the charts, as have the Brooklyn Nets and everyone's projections for the upcoming years. They've locked up Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and DeAndre Jordan for the foreseeable future. The multiple multiple sign and trades. That I thought the sign and trade was dead. It is very, very much back, and it is back with a vengeance. Kemba Walker, he's headed to the Boston Celtics. Terry Rozier's headed to Charlotte. Jimmy Butler, that trade between Philadelphia and Miami is, again, another sign and trade. Uh, it's hit a bit of a snag, but both both sides know that they're really far along, and this has got to get done, so I'm sure that's going to get done here really shortly. But uh, Jimmy Butler's headed to Miami. Al Horford, that mystery is over. He's headed to Philadelphia. Tobias Harris is staying in Philadelphia. The Bucks, they've locked up Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez. They're trading Malcolm Brogdon. He's headed to Indiana, who suddenly, it's a sneaky team out there in the Eastern Conference. The Knicks, they get their coveted signing. They locked up Julius Randle because, you know, Kevin Durant's never going to be the same, and we don't want to pay him a max contract. So the Knicks, yay. See, it's, it's, and that's, the Knicks suck. The Knicks have been irrelevant. The Knicks have been irrelevant forever, but because you have so many sports talk companies, because you have so many sports media companies based on the East Coast, and because so many of the people who go on these TV shows are old, they tell you about the glory days of the New York Knicks and how they're always going to be the Knicks and how New York is always going to be the mecca of basketball. Meanwhile, they've been irrelevant most of our lifetime. Depending on how old you are, okay, they made a finals once. They made a couple of playoffs. They pushed Michael Jordan. A lot of people pushed Michael Jordan when he was around. He didn't do anything. They're garbage. The biggest free agent acquisition in my lifetime has been Amari Stoudemire. Amari freaking Stoudemire. They traded for Carmelo Anthony, blew up their whole team, which, by the way, was doing pretty damn well without Carmelo Anthony, blew that whole thing up, landed Carmelo, had uh, Amari Stoudemire come in there, and still... To this day, they remain irrelevant. But remember, it was just a couple of months ago they were going to get Zion Williamson because they were going to win the draft and they were going to get Kyrie Irving and they were going to get Kevin Durant. Why? Because they're the New York Knicks. And they continue to be run by an ass clown who continues to put that organization. I've said it before. I said it last night on Twitter and I'm going to say it a thousand times. No player of meaningful significance in the NBA will ever sign for a team owned by James Dolan. Never, ever, ever. Adam Silver would be best served to set up some sort of uh, entrapment where they can frame uh, uh, James Dolan for some sort of sex scandal or sexual harassment scandal or anything and get his ass out of the league. And then maybe, just maybe, the New York Knicks will be relevant again. But as long as James Dolan is the owner, they will never be relevant. They will be absolutely worthless. Because no free agent's going to sign that. Now, maybe they'll have to acquire people through draft and maybe through, or maybe they'll have to acquire people through trades. And then through trades, well, you're in the best position to sign someone for a long-term contract. Maybe that's how you're going to have to do it. And they've got a front office. They've got a more than capable front office. But that owner looms large over that franchise and he is destroying it. He is absolutely destroying that franchise. And who hasn't signed yet is just as big a part of the story as who has. Kawhi Leonard. Arguably, in, in, in my mind, we said this last week here on the podcast, the balance of power in the National Basketball Association shifts when Ka- Kawhi Leonard signs, whether it's with the Lakers, the Clippers, or the Raptors. None of those teams made any major moves yesterday. The Clippers, I think, made an important one in that as the night went along, they locked up Patrick Beverly 
to a three year, $40 million contract, which is what we heard his, his target value was. I think that's perfect for him. I would have loved to have him here in Sacramento, but that was very important. I think for Los Angeles. And I also wonder uh, how much, because we're starting to hear a lot of rumblings about the Lakers and that's really making me nauseous because I hate the thought of Kawhi Leonard playing for the Lakers. But I wonder if the Clippers thought, well, we've, we've, we've got, if nothing else, we've got we've to lock up our guy Patrick Beverly here. Now, they still have plenty of money to sign a Kawhi Leonard if he comes in, but we started to hear lately that Kawhi Leonard wants to sign with another star. He doesn't want to carry all of the burden himself. Health, as we heard, uh, was the case in Toronto. is going to be a, a big Im- focus for him. It's going to be really important as to, to how he approaches the upcoming seasons. And you could have a you could have a team where LeBron takes a couple of days off, Anthony Davis takes a couple of days off, Kawhi Leonard takes a couple of days off, and then we've got reports last night that he didn't meet with anybody yesterday, and the process is going to ramp up over the course of the next coming days. And those three teams, they're just stuck. They just got to wait because they all want to sign him, and you all want to commit to him. So the Clippers, the Lakers, the Raptors, they just got to hang and wait. We'll try to cover all of those in depth. And how about the Golden State Warriors? Didn't see that coming at all. But we'll try to get to all of those signings. Uh, And if you want to take part in the show, I'd love for you to do it no matter when you're listening. Morning, noon, night, overnight. Just shoot text messages, 916-888-5898. I do my absolute best to respond to each and every single one of them. 916-888-5898. Help spread the word. Tell all your friends about the podcast that we got going on here. uh, As I'm sure Kings fans are quite excited with the California Classic kicking off today at the Golden One Center. And... A busy first day of free agency for the front office. Uh, Dwayne Dedman, one of the coveted, uh, I guess, coveted by Sacramento Kings fans. He was a guy, I couldn't believe how many Dwayne Dedman experts there were here in Sacramento as we headed into free agency. The entire Kings fan base has feverishly studied film on this young man and seemed to be really excited about his acquisition, believing he is significantly better Then Willie Cauley-Stein, who, by the way, Willie Cauley-Stein's time with the Sacramento Kings is officially over. As they uh, took that uh, qualifying offer off the table, he is now an unrestricted free agent. Willie Cauley-Stein is free to sign with and do whatever he pleases, just as Rock Nation and his agent had told the Sacramento Bee they wanted to do last week. But Dwayne Dedman is on his way in, and as I kind of sarcastically made remarks there about his comparisons to Willie Cauley-Stein, there are things that are undeniable, and it is the fact that Dedman is a significantly better defender than Willie Cauley-Stein is, and he's better around the rim, at least defensively, than Willie Cauley-Stein is. The numbers, well, they're, they're not vastly different, but this is one of those situations where just looking at the numbers can be problematic for you. Dwayne Dedman's impact on the game is bigger for a 48-minute stretch from a, from, a, from a bell-to-bell stretch, if you will, than Willie Cauley-Stein's. Now, there have been games where Willie Cauley-Stein's impact, particularly there at the end, has been very, very valuable. Of course, there have been times where Willie Cauley-Stein's impact on the game has been very detrimental there in the final moments of the game. But Deadman has a... He's, he is the type of player, which is why I think Kings fans love him so much. He is that all-out guy. He, he is the guy who has improved every year that he's been in the league. He is the guy who you can see busts his ass when he's on the floor. In that regard, he's everything that Willie Cauley-Stein isn't. And I still believe that the Sacramento Kings fan base suffers from some sort of DeMarcus Cousins syndrome where they think every player who doesn't like dive on the floor or uh, you know scream and yell and pound his chest and do all that stuff has bad body language or he doesn't care or he's not invested or he doesn't work hard. I never thought that was the case with Willie Cauley-Stein. I didn't think he worked hard or I I didn't think that he didn't work hard. Uh, I believe he cared very much about the game. I believe he worked very hard to become a better player. Uh, He just didn't have the personality that Sacramento Kings fans liked. And as we've noted, he made the fatal flaw of mentioning money during the season. And for some reason that really turns this fan base off. But Deadman, he's that high-energy player. He's that bell-to-bell player. He's the guy who's going to give you everything that he has every time that he's out there on the floor. And I'm going to assume he's walking into a starting lineup there with, with De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, uh, Harrison Barnes, and, and Marvin Bagley. Of course, as soon as free agency got here, the official start of free agency at 3 o'clock, it was announced that Harrison Barnes and that four-year, $85 million contract extension 
is official, and that was followed by the news uh, that uh, the Atlanta Hawks, big man that we just talked about, Dwayne Dedman, is on his way here to the tune of three years and $40 million. Now, there's a, there's a pretty extensive breakdown to have with some of these contracts. The one I didn't see coming came shortly after that, Trevor Ariza. A two-year, $25 million contract, Sam Mamick of The Athletic reports only a partial portion of that second year is guaranteed. Trevor Ariza is the epitome of role players in the NBA. I can't think of one, I can't imagine one fan base not going, oh yeah, I won't, we, we don't need that. Like Trevor Ariza works anywhere. You put Trevor Ariza on any roster in the NBA and he's going to be a valuable player. Uh, he had a very productive stretch with the Washington Wizards last season. I know that's not saying much because it's the Washington Wizards, but nonetheless, uh, 14 plus points per game, five rebounds, just shy of four assists and over uh, one steal, 1.2 steals to be exact per game. And again, that's just over the final uh, 42, 43 game stretch with the Washington Wizards. 6'8", 215. I'm a Trevor Ariza fan. And for the for what they got him for with that partial guarantee, even if it had been two full years guarantee, I, I really don't care. This works. He is a great, great role player. Uh, I think he's a great guy to have in the locker room. And then uh, as the night started to wind down a little bit, the Kings front office stayed busy. That backup point guard that everybody wanted for De'Aaron Fox, Corey Joseph, uh, played last season in Indiana, eight-year veteran, turns 28 in August. Solid, just solid backup player. It's going to be a solid guy to have uh, backup De'Aaron Fox. And now you start looking at what you got here. Deadman, Ariza, Corey Joseph, Harrison Barnes locked up long-term. To me, and I know Kings fans, sometimes we get wrapped up in our, we, we, we want to hit that home run. We want to sign this guy. We want to make a move for that guy. That guy's going to come here. Look how much better we were than last year. Uh, look how this team's growing. We've got guys that want to buy in. We've got uh, superstars around the league buying into what we're doing. This right here says what we've long screamed. The core of the Sacramento Kings, it's already here. Now, yes, adding Kevin Durant would have been fantastic. Adding Cole Highlander would be fantastic. All of that stuff, I, I, I get those thoughts. But what this says, what those signings say, what the Deadman signing says, what the Ariza signing says, what the Joseph signing says, it says that the core players are already here. De'Aaron Fox is a core player. Buddy Heald is a core player. Marvin Bagley III is a core player. I believe Harrison Barnes is a, is, is a part of the core. And, and Harry Giles, watching Harry G Giles develop over the course of the next couple of years, I think ultimately the idea is for Harry Giles to be the starting five. It, enough people have told us, James Ham told us here on this podcast, that, uh, he's, not, he's not there yet. There's some things that he needs to do as a pro player before he should be the starting five. One of them is to settle down because when he gets too amped up, he commits too many fouls and then he's useless for the rest of the game. I totally get all that. I completely understand all that. Remember, this is a guy who was out of basketball for a very, very long time. This is a guy who his coaches have said directly to us that he is the most talented high school basketball player they had ever seen. Now, we didn't get to see that in college. We didn't get to see that his first year as a Sacramento King. But we started to see signs of it. We just saw a young player in the league, and we saw a very antsy young player in the league. Give Harry Giles time to develop, and just looking at the way this con just looking at the way these contracts are structured, the belief is you're going to have to lock up Bagley long term. You're going to have to lock up De'Aaron long term, and if you've really hit a home run on that previous draft, you're going to be locking up Harry Giles long term. And of course, the same is is true for Buddy Heald as well. And you have a significantly better group of defensive players, and I, I can't remember the last time the Kings had this many defenders on their team. Barnes is a defender. Trevor Ariza is, is a very, very good defender. Dwayne Dedman has a presence on the defensive end. I've read enough about Corey Joseph to know that he's, I mean, he's par for the course when it comes to being a defending point guard. But he's also a backup, and his, his role is, is, is a little bit different than I think what Deadman's and Ariza's are. So that's what your Sacramento Kings has done, and the, and the response has been all over the place. I think most people are really pleased with what they were able to accomplish. I would have loved Patrick Beverly to be here. It wasn't in the cards. That's fine. 
People wanted Willie Cauley Stein out of here. Well, he's out. You got what you wanted. Deadman is on his way in here. I don't know who Sacramento Kings wanted over that. I'd take Dwayne Deadman over DeAndre Jordan. I think DeAndre Jordan works with a very specific type of point guard. I think De'Aaron Fox is that point guard, by the way. I just don't, if the Kings have a commitment to defense and the Kings have a commitment, and I think this actually might be a question, the Kings have a commitment to getting up and down the floor like they did last year. I don't know where De'Aaron, uh, excuse me, I don't know where DeAndre fits in that. DeAndre could could be a presence defensively. Obviously, we know how many rebounds he can get. Uh, we know his ability to to get up on both sides of the floor. Uh, but he obviously had his his sights on set, set on something bigger. He's joining his buddies. He actually got a really good contract. We'll go over that in a minute. I was surprised. I thought I thought Jordan was signing for peanuts. He very much he very much did not. Uh, so there are your new Sacramento Kings as the California Classic gets, gets underway tonight. Uh, Dwayne Dedman, Trevor Ariza, Corey Joseph, and of course Harrison Barnes is sticking around. Now, at some point this week, I think, I think we're going to have to have a, a very honest discussion about the Western Conference. I don't think there's any need to have it just yet, but we're going to have to have it. Because this Western Conference is going to be loaded. And I know it is incredibly stomach-turning to think about Kawhi Leonard landing on a Los Angeles Lakers. But if you're a Kings fan, is it better for Kawhi to go to the Lakers than the Clippers? Hear me out here. Because I understand that that loads up the Lakers with, with Anthony Davis and LeBron James and, and Kawhi Leonard and, and whatever. I'm, I'm not going to buy into that whole thing yet. But by not having him on the Clippers, it, it just it weakens a team. It weakens a team in the Western Conference that you're going to be competing for a playoff spot for. But if you have Anthony Davis and LeBron James in Los Angeles, and then you have Kawhi Leonard with that group and what they achieved last year with the Clippers, that's two teams in LA you got to deal with. Now, granted, you're still going to have to deal with Los Angeles, the Clippers, excuse me. You're still going to have to deal with the Clippers. But I would like my chances if I'm a Sacramento Kings fan against a Kawhi Leonard list Clippers. I still don't like the thought of him on the Lakers. I just, I just, I refuse, I absolutely refuse to believe that's going to happen. Refuse. And perhaps it's just denial at this point, but I refuse to believe it's going to happen. Uh, one thing that I did not see coming last night was uh, D'Angelo Russell. D'Angelo Russell is headed to the Golden State Warriors on a four year, $117 million max contract uh clay thompson has been locked in for the five years 190 that has been promised to him uh for weeks for months it appears the warriors are sending andre iguodala to the memphis grizzlies there's some protected first round picks involved here i am fascinated by this deal i'm fascinated at the thought of d'angelo russell and steph curry playing together uh i'm fascinated at the thought that perhaps andre iguodala knew he was being traded or knew he wasn't a part of the Golden State Warriors game plan for next year and just went on the 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 Breakfast Club, which we aired for you uh, on last week's show, one of last week's shows, and just spilled all the tea about the Warriors. Just started talking. It just the medical staff was forcing him back. The medical staff wouldn't acknowledge what his fracture and his his leg was. They kept calling it a bone bruise. Uh, talking about what went on with Kevin Durant and that whole deal. And it was, sure, it's easy to put this together. And then, of course, his his tweets, his little subtext tweets that he put up last night about uh, just landed. I've been putting a puzzle together since Tuesday, which coincidentally was the day he was on The Breakfast Club. And he got it done just in the nick of time with the K capitalized. Andre Iguodala can't be going to the Knicks. No. So the belief is that Andre Iguodala is going to be bought out by the Memphis Grizzlies, and then he's going to be free to sign wherever he wants to. What would he go to the Knicks for? Unless they just throw a bag of money at him, and then that's fine. There's already speculation. (laughs) There's already speculation. He hasn't even been bought out yet that Andre Iguodala is going to wind up a Los Angeles Laker. (sighs) Okay. All right. Andre Iguodala, uh, so he's no longer a member of the Golden State Warriors. Kevin Durant's obviously no longer a member of the Golden State Warriors. I was reading an article in The Athletic today about uh, 
uh, Steph Curry was flying from Japan straight to New York, or I think it was China, excuse me, flying straight from China to New York uh, to meet with Kevin Durant by the time he had landed. The it, it, the deal had already been done. He was going to Brooklyn. He still went to Kevin Durant's apartment and talked to him face to face. And they had their little, they had their little powwow. And, and I, I, I don't, I don't know what Steph Curry did after that. If he got back on a plane and flew back to, uh, flew back to Oakland or Walnut Creek or wherever he lives or Charlotte. Cause at some point he must've gotten alert that, Hey man, uh, you got a new backcourt mate. His name is D'Angelo Russell. He averaged 21.1 points per game. It wasn't for Pascal Siakam. He would have been, the NBA's most improved player last year. He was in the top 10 in assists per game at 7.0 and top 10 in three-point field goal, uh, three-point field goals made. So D'Angelo Russell had an extraordinary year in terms of his shot-making ability. He's going to fit in quite nicely with the Golden State Warriors, but man, I am interested to see how this team works defensively. Chamon Green is going to be carrying quite a big load for you. If, you, if you're just looking to make up scoring with Klay Thompson out, and obviously Kevin Durant gone, well, you, you were able to do that to a certain degree. I hope the Golden State Warriors, and likewise, I hope Klay Thompson commits to not playing next year. I don't want Klay Thompson rushing back. I don't want Klay Thompson to put himself in a, in a difficult situation. The Warriors obviously know that he's injured. Uh, the Warriors know that he got injured in the NBA Finals. I think the Warriors should just take the approach that I believe the Brooklyn Nets are taking and Kevin Durant's taking. And it's I know they're different injuries. Don't I understand that completely, but don't come back. You don't need to come back this year. If we don't win a championship this year, it's okay. It sucks, but it's okay. We don't need you to force your way back into the lineup. Get healthy all next year. Come back. See what the the, the Golden State Warriors, because they're going to have issues they got to deal with next year uh, in, in Draymond Green and his free agency. Now Draymond Green is is locked up with Clutch Sports, and if you don't think agents matter in the NBA, man, you're not paying attention. My old my old co-host Ken Rudolph joined us. Uh, what was it last week? Swears swears to everything that agents are useless. They're not. They're a big big deal. Kevin Durant, Rock Nation. Kyrie Irving fires his agent a couple of weeks ago. Who's he signed with? Rock Nation. That stuff isn't on accident, man. It is not on accident. Anthony Davis locking up with Clutch Sports before the biggest deal in his career. Not an accident. None of this stuff is on accident. These agents and agencies, they know what they're doing. And for those who don't like, you know, one of the talking points today was the Knicks didn't even get a meeting with Kevin Durant. And for those who don't understand, at least in my experience, what happens is an agent will call a team, particularly let's, let's use Kevin Durant's agent as an example. Kevin Durant's agents will call, let's say, the four teams that he's going to talk to. Obviously, he's going to talk to the Warriors. Uh, let's say he's going to talk to the Clippers, the Nets, and the Knicks. Those are the only four teams Kevin Durant's interested in. His agent will call and say, hey, uh, listen, look, we're interested my client is interested. Kevin Durant would like to join you know, the Los Angeles Clippers, okay? Uh, but we need to know he's only interested in signing a max contract. Do you have that max contract available, and would you be willing to talk about what your plans are with your team? Yes, we have that max contract available. The Los Angeles Lakers, my client is interested in joining a new team. Do you have a max contract available to offer? Yes. Brooklyn, same thing. New York, my client would like a max contract, uh, and he's one of the, you're one of the teams he's considering. Do, do you have that ability? Because we're not going to haggle over this. Nah. Nah, we, we're, we're worried. Nah, he's got the Achilles. He's not going to be he's not gonna be himself. We're going to go get Julius Randle. Have a good day. Okay? So that's how all of these deals get done in advance. Like, there's no, there, and it's fine. I don't think the NBA cares, nor should they. How much fun was yesterday? Just as an NBA fan, how much fun was that? I couldn't refresh my phone. I had a game plan for yesterday. I got to take care of my dogs. I got to get my workout in. I got to get some things done around the house. I had a plan. I sat down to eat lunch at like 1 o'clock for a couple of minutes. I had a couple of more things that I wanted to do. And then suddenly it just all started happening. It was Kevin Durant in Brooklyn. It was Kyrie in Brooklyn. And then after that, it was just a floodgate of all of these deals that were going to be announced at 3 o'clock. 
Agents have been talking to teams for months. Months. And the NBA shouldn't even be remotely upset about it. Tampering. I understand Adam Silver finding and implementing tampering rules during the season. Completely understand that. Completely understand that if Magic Johnson is the vice president or president of basketball operations for the Los Angeles Lakers and he's going on talk shows before the before the the Lakers play the Warriors talking about Kevin Durant. That's a hypothetical situation. That's actually the one thing that he didn't do wrong. Or uh, talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo or whatever during the season. I completely understand that. Because you, well, if you're Adam Silver, you got to front a little bit. <laughs> you got to say, hey, we don't want this. You can't publicly do this. But when the season's over, you could do it behind the scenes. Or perhaps even when the season's going on, you could do it. As long as you do it behind the scenes. Don't do it publicly. And I think that's all that Adam Silver and the league care about, is doing it publicly. I don't think that they care that, that, that it was leaked, that Kevin Durant was going was gonna to sign with, with the Brooklyn Nets at, at 2 o'clock instead of 3 o'clock. And how great, what a great stunt. You announced that you announced that you're going to sign if you, you're you're Kevin Durant, you're Kevin Durant's team. You announced that you're going to sign, uh, you're going to announce who you're signing with today, and you're going to do it on your uh, business platform on Instagram, your boardroom Instagram account, and that that account just like doubled or or more in followers within like 30 minutes. Brilliant move by his team. And then once they see the number of followers slowing down, okay, let's give it to Woj or Shams or whoever had it first. I don't remember which one had it first. Let's give it to our, our, our reporter of choice. They'll announce it. The reaction will start to come in. They'll be able to announce Kyrie Irving. And then at 3 o'clock, we'll put our little message up on, on Instagram because we just gained however many millions of followers. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant move by Rock Nation. And Kevin Durant and that whole team there. And the way this stuff gets leaked to the media. Agents, and this is another valuable component to agents. Your, your agent, if you're a player, your agent is almost certainly associated with one of the major insiders. Whether it's Sammy or it's uh, Woj or it's Shams or whoever. They're associated with somebody and they're going to give that information. That information is going to be strategically leaked at a certain time. None of this stuff that happens is on accident. None of it. And I'm so fascinated by how many people might have seen this D'Angelo Russell thing coming because I didn't see it at all. I, 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 and as a matter of fact, I was preparing a conversation today. It's like, well, what do the Warriors do now? You know, Because the Warriors lost Kevin Durant. We know that Klay Thompson is out. They don't really have, you know, just because they didn't re-sign Kevin Durant doesn't mean they suddenly have $32 million to spend. They were already over the cap. But they were able to clear enough space to bring in Andre Iguodala, or excuse me, they were able to clear, uh, bring in enough space by clearing out Andre Iguodala and go to get D'Angelo Russell. But it was D'Angelo Russell's former team that was the talk of the NBA yesterday with uh, Kevin Durant signing a four-year, $164 million contract as buddy Kyrie Irving is coming with him. And, you know, they played together on the, the 2016 Olympic team. They've been all-star teammates in the past. And I don't... Forgive me for being pessimistic, but Kevin Durant or, or Clay, uh, Kyrie Irving was on a... He was on a championship quality team with Cleveland and he wasn't happy and he wanted out and he was on a, a a young championship quality team in which he was the star of. He was meant to be the leader of in Boston and he and he got hurt and that team succeeded without him and he came back and the team was a sea of dysfunction for an entire season and he wanted out of there. He wanted out of there the same year, the same regular season in which he said I'm going to resign here. This was just eight, what was it, seven, eight months apart. If y'all have me back, I'm going to resign here. Said that the day before the season started. From that moment forward, everything for him and the Boston Celtics went straight to hell. Everything. And there was, there's barely any talk of the fact that he publicly committed to the Boston Celtics. I think it's because it's Kyrie Irving and no one even takes him seriously. I was like, uh, it's okay, he's whatever. He's not staying here. I don't even know that it, even then, I don't know that anybody believed it. 
So why? So now he's going to be happy? Okay, good. I hope he is. I hope Kyrie Irving is super happy. But he's got to go through an entire year without Kevin Durant. So Brooklyn kind of punted next year, and that's fine. They punted the 2019-20 season with the idea of greater riches in the uh, 2021 season and, and, and 2020 and beyond. Okay. that's a It's a bold strategy, Cotton. You're able to bring in DeAndre Jordan as well? Like, all right. I believe four years, 40 million. I mean, I, that's, oh, that's more than I expected. For DeAndre Jordan, that's, that's more than I expected. And I don't know the uh, intricacies of that contract either. I don't know uh, how many of those uh, are fully guaranteed years. I don't know if there's any partial money there at the end. I don't know if there's any player options. I just have four years, 40. That's what, that's what I've got. And this stuff will all sort itself out over the course of the next five days when the league year becomes official on July 6th. In my estimation, Brooklyn's greatest free, free agent acquisition is our guy Garrett Temple. I'm happy Garrett got on that roster right there. He's going to get a lot of run next year without Kevin Durant out, so that's a good position for him to be in, and we know that Garrett Temple will fight teammates, so if he has to punch Kyrie Irving in the nose, I certainly hope he does it. But there's this overwhelming belief that this Brooklyn Nets thing was a massive success, and it it, it absolutely was. When you're able to sign guys like Kevin Durant and, and Kyrie Irving, that's a success. Can't argue that. You're able to bring in DeAndre Jordan, success. Garrett Temple, high-quality player, great defensive player, level 10 locker room guy, great. That's all good stuff. But we've got to acknowledge they're not going to be the favorites next year. And I'm going to be unapologetically biased all year and root for the Boston Celtics. And even in my unapologetic and biased opinion, I still, I still think put all that aside that the Boston Celtics are going to win that division next year. Now, what does it look like the year after? I'm not really sure. What does it look like when Kevin Durant comes back? I'm not really sure because I do think Kevin Durant is in a great situation where he doesn't play next year. He's going to be healed, you know, towards the end of the regular season in terms of his ability to play basketball and be physical and be active. He's going to be ready to do that around the start of the playoffs next year. So he's going to have roughly from, I don't know, May-ish, April-ish, May-ish, all the way until September, October to get back to Kevin Durant, the game, get back to his game to, to improve, to not just rehab, but to improve. Because too many people, like we, we go back, well, DeMarcus Cousins is the last guy, and gosh, that just didn't really work out for his time in the Golden State Warriors. Like, no, it didn't, but he had to rush back to get on the floor to try to win another contract. Like, he had to play to earn another contract. We mentioned guys that haven't been signed yet. Obviously, Kawhi Leonard is the biggest. DeMarcus Cousins is still out there. And I wonder if we haven't heard anything on that front because some of the teams that are interested in him are the Lakers and the Clippers and the Raptors because you can't make a move on DeMarcus Cousins until you know that Kawhi Leonard isn't coming in to spend your money. But DeMarcus isn't a fair example in terms of an Achilles injury because uh, their body types are completely different. The timing of his injury put him in a position to where he was going to be able to come back and play a little bit for the Golden State Warriors, and he was going to have to do that because he had lost all of his money. Like, I don't mean like literally lost it. I'm talking about the money he was going to earn in contracts. He had lost it all. He had to come back. Kevin Durant doesn't have to do that. When Kevin Durant comes back in the 2020 season, he's coming back for the sole purpose of winning another NBA championship. He doesn't have to prove anything to, to, to earn another contract. He's earned max dollars. He's earned max money his whole career. He's good. And Brooklyn and NKD both need, need to take advantage of that. But I guess I, maybe I'm the only one who just thinks, yeah, maybe this isn't going to end well. Because Kyrie Irving, Cleveland, it didn't end well. Boston, Kyrie Irving, it didn't end well. LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, it didn't end well. Oh, but now all of a sudden he's with his friend Kevin Durant, so it's going to be fine. Okay. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. And I love that Brooklyn is now the team in New York. I just w- stop talking about the Knicks. I want everybody to stop talking about the Knicks. How embarrassing is it of that organization to issue a statement on the first night of free agency 
While we understand that some Knicks fans could be disappointed with tonight's news, we continue to be upbeat and confident in our plan to rebuild the Knicks to compete for championships in the future through both the draft and targeted free agents. And they actually amended that statement later and threw something in about their young core guys. What a disaster. I feel so bad for Steve Mills because I refuse to believe that that was Steve Mills that issued that statement. It was attributed to Steve Mills, but it was that idiot that runs the team that made him put that statement out. A couple hours into free agency, the Knicks fans had to apologize. Because remember, the Knicks fans are entitled to everything. They're entitled to Zion Williamson. They're entitled to Kevin Durant. They're entitled to Kyrie Irving. And they're entitled because of, because of all of these idiots that are 55 and 60 years old go on television and talk about how great the New York Knicks franchise is and how we have to restore them to greatness. I am a basketball fan. I watch basketball all day, every day during the regular season. And I couldn't give a single solitary you-know-what if the New York Knicks are good. And I won't, I won't watch or root or give a damn about that team as long as James Dolan owns it. And apparently... None of the NBA players will either. Unless you're in a position like Julius Randle is. And I don't fault him. I like Julius Randle. I love the thought of the Sacramento Kings acquiring Julius Randle last year before they centered in on uh, Marvin Bagley as their draft pick. My scenario, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, was always Luka Doncic in the draft. Try to get Julius Randle in free agency. No, it didn't work out, but I still have a tremendous amount of respect for Julius Randle. I have a tremendous amount of respect for how he, he, he transformed his body and how he refined his game. And the New York Knicks wanted to throw some money at him. Take it, brother. Take it. But he's not a top-tier free agent, and no top-tier free agent is ever going to play for that franchise with that owner. I feel like Jimmy Butler has wanted to be a member. You know, before we get to that, let me remind you that uh, Vibe Health Bar recently voted best vegetarian restaurant in Folsom, offered salads, wraps, sandwiches, superfood smoothies, acai bowls, and organic cold pressed juice. I drink one of those every single day. There is no juice in town as good as the ones at Vibe Health Bar. Go get the birthday suit juice. It's got a nice little. Nice little kick of citrus in it. It's got some orange in it, man. That's really good stuff. Five Health Bar has locations in East Sacramento and Oak Park, as well as the one in Folsom as, uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, you can stalk us at Vibe Health Bar. Um, make sure you subscribe to the show as well. Tell all your friends about the show. Let them know, hey, we've got local content here. It's just not on the radio anymore, man. It's on the podcast. So search Damian Barling on all pa- podcast platforms. Uh, share the links with your friends and let's continue to grow this community here. Now, as we get back to some of the news from yesterday, Jimmy Butler, I feel like he's wanted to be a member of the Miami heat for a very, very long time. And it became apparent that the Philadelphia 76ers, they had something in the works and they've had it in the works for a while. Jimmy Butler had kind of said his goodbyes. If you had paid attention to social media messages, Jimmy Butler had targeted in on the Miami heat. If you paid more attention to social media messages, you knew Jimmy Butler was going to get a max contract. Uh, I didn't know that the sign and trade was coming, and I certainly didn't know that Al Horford was going to be a part of all of this. But uh, Jimmy Butler is headed to Miami. Uh, Josh Richardson is headed to Philadelphia. Now, Dallas was involved in this somehow, and it involved Goran Dragic, and apparently that that's that that that's fallen apart a little bit. Like they're they're having to change course on that, but they're they're so far along. They're 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 going to get a deal done somehow, and. Dallas out of I guess I, I, I guess or I, I should say Miami they're they're gonna they're, they're gonna move Goran Dragic as soon as possible um and what a weird journey this has been for Jimmy Butler Jimmy Butler a high-end two-way player one of the best two-way players in the entire league you know has that in, incredible run in Chicago uh, goes to Minnesota Reunited with Thibs, that we all know what that turned into. Heads to Philadelphia, uh, has his moments there, and now it seems like you know perhaps for the first time he's. I feel this is where he's wanted to be. It, it, I feel like this is where he's wanted to be for a really long time. Now he's fi- he's finally in Miami. I don't know what to think of the Miami Heat. I don't know what to think of teams five and down in the Eastern Conference. That's going to that's gonna require uh, a lot of analytical work, but it's, it's hard to believe that Philadelphia won't be in the top four 
of the Eastern Conference as they they locked in Tobias Harris for a long term deal, uh, five years, one hundred eighty million dollar max contract for them. Uh, I didn't again, not not one that I expected. Philly so uh, cash strapped, I wasn't sure how they now. Tobias is is their player. They can go over the cap with him, but I was surprised to see uh, that was the guy that they went for. But obviously, Jimmy Butler wanted to be somewhere else, and I think that's ca- Jimmy Butler's a. It, it's fun for guys to say, I, I want to win. The only thing I care about is winning. Winning is all I care about. I don't think I've ever heard Jimmy Butler say that. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that I've ever heard Jimmy Butler say what he wants. Other, other than the occasions that he said he wanted to be traded. But I feel like Jimmy Butler is happy as hell in Miami. Like, this is what he wanted. Miami's not going to win. or they, I mean, they, they could be playoff bound. I don't think they're going to win an NBA championship or even com- like really, really compete for an NBA championship. But I don't think that matters to Jimmy Butler. I don't, I don't think he could be happier here at this point. So, so he's on his way. Uh, and Al Horford, the mystery, who was it? Who was the team who was locked in on Al Horford? Uh, I was positive. 99.999% positive. He was staying in the Eastern conference. I absolutely thought it was Indiana. Once Bogdanovich was gone and once, uh, you know, Darren Collison retired, by the way, at the age of 31. Once those things started happening, I thought, oh, yeah, this is this is easy. I, w- I was right. I had it. And you best believe in my drafts, I had the clip of last week's show. It was the episode that James Ham was on, the uh, uh, Jimothy episode, where we were talking about Al Horford. And I thought, Indiana, it's the perfect fit. I had the audio clip and I was ready to post it the second Woj proved me right. I have since deleted that draft that was in my Twitter account. I didn't, I didn't see this at all. More, more specifically, I didn't see how it would work. I'm starting to believe I don't actually understand the salary cap. Uh, but Al Horford, four years, $97 million guaranteed, $12 million in incentives. He's locked up here. Uh, that has to make Joel Embiid happy as Joel Embiid struggled quite a bit against Al Horford. Uh, but check this out. Career salary for Al Horford. Al Horford's a 14.1, 8.4, uh, 3.2 per game guy on his career. I need to get some theme music, like some game show music like Dan Patrick has for, for this portion of the show. Last year, he made $28.9 million. Next season, Al Horford will make $23.8 million. At the end of this four-year extension, not counting the $12 million of incentives, at the end of this extension, Al Horford will have earned for what would have been a 16-year pro career at that point, a Hall of Good career, a first ballot Hall of Good career, Al Horford, Career earnings, $255.3 million. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Albert or Alvin or perhaps just Al. You can call me Al Horford. $255.3 million. Mm, mm, mm. Good for him. And good for Kemba Walker. I'm excited that Kemba Walker is out of Charlotte. I think that raises a lot of questions. The fact that Boston and Charlotte switched guards is amazing. The fact that Michael Jeffrey Jordan, the greatest professional basketball player to ever live in most people's estimation, would not pay Kemba Walker a max contract to sign with his organization is amazing. The fact that he continues to just function as a horrible owner. And I don't, maybe he's not making the decisions. Maybe it's the front office. Maybe he's just hiring bad people. I don't know what it is, but part of me is really excited that they let that, that, that didn't get done because Kemba Walker is now a member of the Boston Celtics. He joins uh, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Gordon Haywood, Marcus Smart, uh, Robert Williams is there. Rookie Grant Williams is there. And they have, you know, and unless it's one of those uh, uh, Williams guys that I just named, they probably have a starting five available. 
a, a start, it, it was starting five, by, I mean, starting five position, a center. And, you know, looking at the, looking at the math, I thought, oh, what if Willie Cauley Stein signed in Boston? Willie Cauley Stein isn't going to be able to get paid by Boston the kind of money that he wants, but I don't know who's going to pay Willie the kind of money that he wants. I don't even know what type of money Willie wants anymore. I know what he wanted at the beginning of the season, and I have to believe a, a, a day into free agency, he knows he's not going to get that. But I, I, don't, I don't know what they have to offer. I know Ennis Cantor is still out there. I have, for a number of years, tried to get DeMarcus Cousins onto the Boston Celtics. I don't know if DeMarcus is willing to take another, you know, nothing deal, because I think that's what it would be. I think it would be in the vicinity of 5 or $6 million. I say nothing. Hopefully you know what I mean by that, in, in retrospect to the money that has been thrown around. It's a very low-end deal for an NBA player, especially for a guy like DeMarcus Cousins. We heard that the Knicks would throw a bag at, at, at DeMarcus Cousins for one year. We'll have to see if, if that's true. Of course, they just signed Julius Randle, so maybe that doesn't even make any sense anymore. But there is quite possibly a, a starting center position open for the Boston Celtics. They got a, they got a good young team, and I've, I've said this, and you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm going to be unapologetically biased towards that team. I'm going to be rooting for them uh, all year. Uh, but I, I love this. Kemba Walker is one of my favorite players. Kemba Walker, I mean, Russell Westbrook, Dame Lillard, Kemba Walker, probably my top three favorite players in the league. And I'm happy in order to watch Kemba Walker, now I no longer have to watch the Charlotte Hornets. I'm happy that I can I can put the Charlotte Hornets next to the New York Knicks on the shelf and not watch them anymore. Unless they're playing Boston or Sacramento or the Clippers or a team that I actually care about. But I'm ha- I mean Kemba Walker, he he averaged 25.6 last year. He's averaged 20 plus point game, 20 plus points per game the last 4 seasons. He's a 19.5 uh, points per game guy through his career. Kemba's underrated, man. He was a so much fun in college. I love the, I love this signing by the Boston Celtics. Uh, I love the Boston Celtics team next year. I think next year they're winning that Atlantic Division. I I I, I could say that with almost certainty. I think they're winning that division. What does it look like when Kevin Durant comes back? I'm not really sure. Uh, but a big question that a lot of people have had is, okay, well, who's the favorite in the in the East now? Now we still have Kawhi Leonard out there. Kawhi Leonard resigns with Toronto; they're the favorite in the East. But if they don't, and as of right now, the Toronto Raptors don't have Kawhi Leonard. So if you told me you got to pick a favorite for the Eastern Conference today, I think it's Milwaukee. That's who I liked last year. They locked up Chris Middleton to the and how happy is Giannis Antetokounmpo today? They locked up Chris Middleton for the richest contract in in uh, franchise history. Five years, hundred and seventy eight million dollars, and that's the the second that's the that's the richest deal for a second round pick in NBA history. Giannis Antetokounmpo has got to be counting the money already. Like, man, I'm going to get so paid by this organization, it's going to be ridiculous. Brooke Lopez, four years, $52 million with the Bucks. He had a great run with the Bucks. 187 three-pointers. That's fantastic. It's the most by a seven-footer in NBA history. Now the Bucks apparently, uh, they've reached a two-year deal uh, with his brother as well. Uh, Robin Lopez is headed to the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, not a, not a big needle mover for me, uh, but I still like the Bucks because I still like Giannis, I still like Chris Middleton, and I still think Brooke Lopez fits in perfectly uh, with what that team's doing and the way that team is coached uh, by Budenholzer. Starting to you know weed your way through that Eastern Conference, you got to look at the you got to look at the Pacers as well. Victor Oladipo coming back. Malcolm Brogdon headed over there. That was another sign and trade again. I thought the sign and trade in today's NBA was virtually dead. It is very much not as there were more. I, there, I, got, I got to have someone look this up or I've got to look this up or I got to figure out a way to look this up. There had to have been more sign and trades yesterday than in the last several years combined. Like I remember like I think Bosch and LeBron were sign and trades when the Heatles were formed. And then I feel like it kind of died after that because it's so difficult to pull off. I can, and I certainly don't remember this many sign in trades on, on free agency day, on the first day of free agency. 
How do we rank basketball excitement, by the way? Like free agency day versus Christmas day versus like what's after that? MLK day is really good. Uh, I mean, I don't, no one really gets excited for all-star Saturday night. I don't think certainly nobody gets excited for the all-star game is free agency day. The most exciting day in basketball, unless you've got like game seven of the NBA finals. And still, even with Game 7 of the NBA Finals, I don't think it generates as much interest as Free Agency Day. Because with Free Agency Day, you're encompassing every team in the league. Every team, every fan base is riding highs and lows based on what their insiders that they've got set to their Twitter alerts tweet. Free Agency Day has to be the, the kind of the pinnacle of the NBA basketball season. Which is so great, and then maybe Christmas Day after that, and then I and I, I don't I don't I don't even know that I don't even know that there is a three. Just the most interesting days for NBA: free agency day, Christmas. Free agency day really is like Christmas. You we spent all season, all of last year talking about we did this through the playoffs, we did it through the regular season. Well. You know, if, if, if the Clippers, look how well the Clippers have played this year. If they get Kawhi Leonard le- next year, oh, well, if the Raptors don't win at all, they're going to lose Kawhi Leonard. Oh, the Raptors did win it all. Are they still going to lose Kawhi Leonard? What's Anthony Davis going to do? Who can we add with LeBron James? What's going to happen with Kevin Durant? Are Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving going to play together? What's going to happen with the Boston Celtics? We did it all year. And then just like Christmas Day, we tore open the presents and it was all over. And we're just waiting on Kawhi. Just waiting on one more major domino to drop. And I feel like everything is going to be at a, at a standstill until we hear what Kawhi Leonard is going to do. And the way it was stated last night, I thought the jump did a fantastic job last night, yesterday. I watched Rachel Nichols and that crew for five hours. I thought they did. I, Dave Yeager, poor Dave Yeager. Like he was out there on the table. I don't think he really knew when to get in there. He offered a lot when he talked. I just don't think he knew how to get into the conversation when he was out there. I thought he did a good job. I don't know that if, if that was his first time on TV or not, or if it was his first time doing something like that, but they did a good job. You know, Rachel was out there the whole five hours, but they rotated in, you know, Winhurst, they rotated in, Shanae uh, Abumake, they ro- ro- rotated in various uh, different ESPN personalities, Ramona Shelburne there who were in Los Angeles and, I thought it was good. I thought Matt Barnes did a really good job. I enjoy Matt Barnes simply because his delivery is chill and he's not screaming at you and he just conveys simple points. Like he was talking about J.J. Redick with the Pelicans, which I think is a sneaky, great signing. And J.J. Redick continues to make really good money. Now, it's not what he made in Philadelphia, but two years, $26.5 million deals with the Pelicans. Continues. That just shows you one uh, what type of locker room guy that he is. And two, shooters will always be able to contribute, especially smart shooters. And that's what J.J. Redick is. And the crazy part with J.J. is the second he walks away from basketball, he's going to get a ton of money as a basketball analyst or a basketball host. Because he is J.J. is one of those frustrating guys who everything he does, he does great. Whether it's shoot, play ball, whatever. Oh, I'm going to host a podcast. Great. He's a great podcast host. He's better than people who actually host podcasts for a living. He's better than I am. Obviously, he can offer a completely different perspective than I am, but he is so good already. And the second, there's going to be a bidding war between TNT and, and ESPN for his services. Uh, but listening to Matt Barnes talk about JJ yesterday, it was just like, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great locker room guy. This is a tremendous move by Griff. And it was just so chill, so straightforward. And it's like, yeah, we, we wouldn't know that. We wouldn't know what JJ is like in the locker room. And Matt Barnes was able to bring that perspective. I enjoyed what ESPN did yesterday. As much as I get frustrated with them, I love their NBA coverage yesterday. I love that it was headed up by uh, Rachel Nichols and, and not some of the other hosts that they use. And I thought the way that they did it was, was really good. It was a lot of fun. They couldn't even keep up with the amount of news that was coming in. It was coming in at such a rapid rate. Uh, I couldn't refresh my phone fast enough. I I was afraid if I opened my phone, I was going to miss the alert. I was going to miss what I would be in Twitter responding to people and the alert would pop up and be, wait a minute, that's from Woj. What did it say? And one of the ones I almost missed was actually the Trevor Ariza one. It was kind of one of those ones where I was staring at like, wait, 
That says Sacramento. Sacramento Kings, two years. Trevor. Oh, Trevor Ariza. Can I say one other thing about the Kings? I know I'm, I'm kind of all over the place here at this point. It really feels like the leaks in Sacramento are gone. I didn't hear anything about Trevor Ariza. I didn't hear anything about Corey Joseph. I, you know, the Harrison Barnes stuff was purposely put out there. I, I think this Sacramento Kings front office is doing a, a, a really good job. And I said years ago, after the DeMarcus Cousins trade, Vlade could win me over as a general manager. I thought he got this job when he was not prepared for it. He was not ready for it. And he shouldn't be speaking in front of people about what he's doing. Right now, he's won me over. I, the, the, the biggest detriment, I think, to the Sacramento Kings moving forward is the Western Conference. This team is good. It's very young. It's very good. It has a very, very high ceiling. But we might be entering the most brutal year of conference play we've ever seen. I was just going to speak about how good I think the Indiana Pacers are. With Malcolm Brogdon heading there, I was surprised they let Bogdanovich go, but Bogdanovich is headed to Utah. He was, he was exposed a little bit, and it, it's difficult to really evaluate the team last year because of the loss of Victor Oladipo, but Bogdanovich had a really difficult time in the playoffs. But he's headed to Utah now, who made the acquisition to get uh, Mike Conley earlier this year, and suddenly... That's why I said earlier, we're going to have to have a really honest discussion about the Western Conference. Because we've got to look at teams like Utah and what they were able to do. Because again, you can put teams into the playoffs. You can say this team is good enough to make the playoffs and this team is good enough to make the playoffs. But then you have to say, in turn, this team isn't good enough to make the playoffs. Who's that going to be? And I, there, there, are some, there are some names. Like I'm more inclined to think maybe... Oklahoma City misses the playoffs before I am Utah misses the playoffs. And maybe that's because Utah did some things here this offseason and Oklahoma City didn't. More specifically, Oklahoma City can't. They just they're they're in they're 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 in that salary cap purgatory that we were talking about the other day, where you've got to commit to being over the 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 cap to compete for a championship. And they have committed. They have committed to be in that luxury area. They have committed to pay. They have committed to be over the cap and deal with the repeat tax offender. But they can't compete for a championship. Now, maybe this is the year that they can do it with the Warriors being weakened. And I like their chances if Kawhi winds up with the Clippers and the Lakers remain with Anthony Davis and and, and LeBron James, and we can go ahead and throw Andre Iguodala in there if you want to. I, I think anybody in the conference can compete with that. I'm not sold on the Lakers with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And I, when I say that, I don't mean like I'm not sold on them. They'll, they'll be good. I'm just not ready to concede the championship to them. I think we should be, given what just happened with the Toronto Raptors, given the fact that we've seen a 73 regular season win team lose, that we should end the whole, oh, the season's not worth watching. Oh, this isn't even fun anymore. Because everybody said that last year. We all thought the Warriors were going to win. A handful of people, for whatever reason, thought the Rockets might have a chance to knock off uh, the Warriors and win the NBA championship. But for the most part, people thought it was going to come down, if nothing else, the Warriors and the, and the Rockets. With no credit going to any of the teams in the Eastern Conference. And then suddenly it became the Milwaukee Bucks. Out of nowhere, everybody thought the Bucks were going to win the, the, the NBA championship. And then the Raptors went on to win the NBA championship. So this whole let's close up the season before the season even starts, we don't need to do that anymore. But this is a wide open Western Conference. I mean, where do you see Portland landing in all of this? That's what I say, man. This is, this is going to be our homework. And we're gonna, we'll do it sometime this week. We'll get it in before the holiday. We'll have an honest discussion about what the Western Conference looked like and what it's going to take for the Sacramento Kings to crack that top eight. That's what we talked about last year. Oh, it's okay if the Kings don't make the playoffs. It's okay because they're like a 50-win team next year. They're like a five-seed next year. Like, whoa. Whoa. No, another team I'm not sold on at least year one is Dallas. Not year one. But we'll see. We'll see. Let's step back. Let's, we'll revisit this on Wednesday. All right? We'll, we'll get all of the news out today. I feel like we're we're probably not going to touch on any other sports today. There is some news. Ezekiel Elliott's meeting with the NFL uh, to talk about that incident with the security guard. Nothing as of yet 
has come out of the meeting with the NFL and Tyree Kill. Apparently they met for like eight and a half hours sometime last week. So we'll get to all of the other stories. There was an incredible, I mean, the, the, the Yankees and the Red Sox, I think they're still scoring runs overseas. I think they scored more points as a baseball team than any of the football teams that go over there score. Uh, but that all feels like secondary news uh, after yesterday in the National Basketball Association. Derrick Rose signed a two-year deal. This is one I was really interested in as well. Derrick Rose signed a two-year, $15 million deal with the Detroit Pistons. I think that's a good deal uh, for the Pistons. I think uh, Derrick Rose is a guy who can come in and help. Um, this is the fifth team for Derrick Rose. And just off the top of my head, I'm trying to think if I can name them all. Obviously, he started in Chicago. He was in Cleveland, New York, Minnesota, and then Detroit. That's it, right? Okay. All right. Man, Derrick Rose. Uh, Two years, $15 million for him. I think we mentioned Patrick Beverly. He got the three-year, $40 million deal that he was hoping for. That number wasn't put out on there on accident. I'm sure it was agreed to. Uh, with the Los Angeles Clippers. He turns 31. I, I love Patrick Beverly, uh, except when he's guarding De'Aaron Fox and except when he's guarding um, except when he's guarding Russell Westbrook. Uh, we were just talking about the Portland Trailblazers here, and I'm being alerted, uh, as we're all being alerted. It's just you're listening to this on tape delay. The Miami Heat are sending Hassan Whiteside to the Portland Trailblazers for Mo Harkless and Myers Leonard. Okay, a change of scenery was needed. (laughs) I think that's an understatement. A change of scenery was very much needed for Hassan Whiteside. Uh, Maybe Portland is the perfect landing spot for him. Okay, I felt like Portland needed to do something else. I mean, it's great that they locked up Dame Lilla long term. No question about that. But I did feel like they needed to do a little bit something else, particularly given how rough this Western Conference is going to be. I don't know that that move puts them over the top. I don't know what that move does uh, for them, period. But it does something. At least it's an effort. Hey, we're going to go out there. We're going to attract the big man. Obviously, Cantor was a part of what they did last year. I don't think he's he's not going to be a part of what they're doing moving forward. So, I think a change of scenery is good for Hassan Whiteside, and I think he can be effective uh, for the Portland Trailblazers. Also noted here at, while we're recording the show, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski tweeted that Seth Curry has reached an agreement with the Dallas Mavericks uh, four years, $32 million, according to Adrian Wojnarowski. So that deal is out there. If you want to be a part of the show, want to text your thoughts on the show, want to text your thoughts on anything that we have talked about here today, 916 888 5898 again that is 916 888 5898 one reason all of this money is being thrown around these are top tier athletes these guys are game fit it's our new sponsor game fit uh, whether you're an athlete or you're a business person or whether you're a stay at home mom you're stay at home dad male or female adult or kid it doesn't matter no one offers better training than my folks over at game fit if you have sports specific interests for you or your kids baseball football basketball even MMA uh, they have someone for you. Uh, Athletes from all sports train there. TV personalities train there. Even former radio show hosts and current podcast hosts, they train there and they all do it for a reason. There is no one better than Lim Adams and the folks over at GameFit. If you're on Instagram, give them a follow on Instagram right now. He is very visual in the work that he does. You can see him working out athletes and you can see him working out people all day long. Uh, again, follow him on GameFit. It's at GameFit on Instagram, and you can give him a call if you want to find out more about this. 916-550-0658. Again, 916-550-0658. Uh, get GameFit. Tell him you heard heard about him here on the podcast. Speaking of other sports news, it's Bobby Bonilla Day. It happens every year. It's a tradition unlike any other. Uh, Bobby Bonilla, 56 years old. He will collect the check. For $1.1 million, just shy of $1.2 million from the New York Knicks today. And he does that every year on July 1st uh, from 2011 to 2035. Oh, man. In 2000, uh, for those who don't know the story, I think everybody knows the story. The Mets and Bobby Bonilla agreed to a buyout of the remaining $5.9 million on Bonilla's contract. 
However, instead of paying Bobby Bonilla $5.9 million at the time, the Mets agreed to make annual payments of $1.2 million for 25 years, including a negotiated 8% interest increase. Wow. At the time, for those who don't know this, the Mets ownership was involved uh, with a Bernie Madoff account that promised a double-digit interest rate over the course of the deal, and the Mets were poised to make a significant profit if that uh, Bernie Madoff account delivered. Spoiler alert! It did not. Wow. I thought the Knicks were poorly run. What is the math on that? Instead of paying $5.9 million, you paid annual payments of $1.2 million over 25 years, including an 8% interest increase. Holy crap. Uh, stay glued to your phones all throughout the day uh, because, oh, what's Kawhi Leonard going to do? Clippers, Lakers, or Raptors? And what happens to the two teams he doesn't sign with? If he heads to the Lakers, what happens with the Clippers and the Raptors? What do the Raptors do in this situation? Danny Green is still out there. High quality player. Again, I have to imagine teams in contention are very interested in Danny Green, but they can't afford to throw money at anybody that's not named Kawhi Leonard. And I'm talking about those three teams I just mentioned, the two in LA and Toronto. DeMarcus Cousins, will he gain any traction? Are we looking at one-year deals for him? Are we looking at minimum deals for him? And is is free agency at a pause right now until Kawhi Leonard decides what he's going to do? What's Willie Cauley-Stein going to get? That's another one that I'm I'm really, really interested in. What will Willie Cauley-Stein get? What will his offers be? How many teams are truly, truly interested in him? Ennis Cantor is out there. Uh, he's, a, he's a starting five for somebody. I wonder if it's Boston. I wonder if Willie is an option for Boston, though I don't think they, they have much, uh, much money to offer him. Uh, we'll close things out with your questions, as we always do. Again, I pull your questions uh, straight from Facebook. Search Damian Barling there. Hit the like button. I pull them from Twitter, at Damian Barling, Instagram as well. Uh, at Damian Barling, and of course our text line, 916-888-5898. Text, Facebook, tweet, IG, all day long. I have my phone with me. I love nothing more uh, than speaking with you guys uh, about all these wonderful topics on a day-to-day basis. Uh, This one from Raphael. Could perhaps, could you perhaps rank teams in the East now, Uh, at least the top four after all the changes that happened? Um, Next season. I kind of hinted at this earlier next season only because I think things will definitely change with Brooklyn. My top three, I have to, I, there's no reason to not still rank Milwaukee. Number one, I like what Philadelphia did, but I, I, I don't think it's enough to rank them above Milwaukee. I liked Milwaukee a lot after I saw them in person at the golden one center last year. And I, they, Giannis Antetokounmpo is still there, right? Coach Bud's still the coach. Uh, Chris Middleton's locked up. Brooke Lopez is locked up. Now they let Brogdon go, who was a big, physical, important presence for them. Uh, but I still like what the Bucks have done. Uh, I'm all in on that. I'll still have them as the top team in the Eastern Conference. Uh, number two, uh, the Boston Celtics. I like the Boston Celtics more than the Philadelphia 76ers because I like Kemba Walker more than I like anybody on the Philadelphia 76ers. I still like that young core on the Boston Celtics, and I still like the fact that Kyrie Irving's not there. You talk about addition by subtraction? Well, this may very well be it by the Boston Celtics. Just I don't think Danny Ainge cares Kyrie left. I would love to know if Kyrie and, and Danny Ainge even engaged in a conversation I would love to know if Danny off the record would just tell you, I don't care. I didn't want him back. He was too much of a locker room issue. You know, Kings fans are always concerned a certain player coming in. You hear this all the time. And I understand because the Sacramento Kings are so young. You hear, oh, we don't want them here. They're going to stunt the growth of dot, dot, dot. Oh, you even heard this about Al Horford. I don't want Al Horford here. He's going to screw up the growth of Harry Giles and Marvin Bagley. Oh, I don't want... Patrick Beverly here, he's going to mess up De'Aaron Fox. Like you would hear those arguments made all the time. I don't think they were accurate arguments, but you're entitled to make them. Well, I think you could argue Kyrie might have stunted the growth of a couple of young players there in Boston. If not, he just gave everybody a bad attitude. Because I think a lot of times, 
you take on the demeanor of your leader. Kings fans, you can relate to this, right? When DeMarcus Cousins was here, you would see a lot more surly looking Kings players. DeMarcus was gone. The vibe around the team changed. The energy around the team changed. And suddenly you saw a completely different demeanor within the group. I'm not going to blame DeMarcus Cousins for all of that, but I do believe there's something to it. I do believe there is something to taking on the demeanor of, the, of, of your best player, of your quote-unquote leader. If Kyrie was the leader for that team, everybody on the Boston Celtics took on his personality, which isn't a good thing. And the fact that he's gone, I think, is good for the Boston Celtics. So at number one in the Eastern Conference right now, I have Milwaukee. Number two, Boston. At number three, that's where I'm going to put Philadelphia. And I'm doing all of this because Toronto hasn't signed Kawhi Leonard yet. And so Boston, uh, Milwaukee, Boston, Philadelphia, I don't know who to put forth. I feel like it's Indiana. I mean, Miami is well coached. Jimmy Butler's there now but I'm not convinced they're the fourth best team in the Eastern Conference. Toronto without Kawhi, as well coached as they are, I'm not sure that they're the fourth. Maybe maybe that's what it comes down to. If Toronto is without Kawhi, I still think they're a more than capable team, just not a championship team. I think they're a more than capable team. Of course, Danny Green is gone too, so you got to factor that in. Yeah, I think I'll go Indiana. Top four teams of the Eastern Conference. Milwaukee. Boston, Philly, Indiana. That's where I'll go right there. Uh, another text here. This this person didn't leave a name. If you leave your name the first time you text, uh, I can lock you into the contacts. 916-888-5898. Even if you've texted a thousand times and have never left your name before, uh, leave it on your next text and I'll lock you in and uh, give you credit for all of your questions. Uh, not to be negative, but what does Dwayne Dedman really offer more than Willie Cauley-Stein? I know specifically it's rebounds and blocks, but I feel underwhelmed with that signing, especially considering his age versus Willie's. I'd almost rather see Harry Giles start at center next year and Deadman come off the bench in this situation. Um, yeah, again, I think it's looking at stats too much rather than looking at game presence. Dwayne Deadman has a, a tremendous presence to the game. We used the term earlier. He's a bell to bell guy. Uh, he's a tip to buzzer guy. He plays hard. He's 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 basically everything that Willie Cauley Stein's detractors hate about him he's high energy he'll dive on the floor he'll go after everything like he is he's a stronger presence on both sides of the court than Willie Cauley Stein is I think Willie Cauley Stein is a better offensive player than Dwayne Dedman is but that wasn't really the problem that wasn't the issue with Willie Cauley Stein and the Sacramento Kings and if scoring was the only thing we were talking about Willie would still be a member of the Kings I trust enough people who think Harry Giles isn't ready to start to believe them. I trust people who see Harry Giles every single day uh, during practice who say he's not he he he's going to be a starter he, he, as long as he continues to grow. He's a, he's a capable starter. He's just not ready for that yet. Let Deadman start. Let Giles get his minutes off the bench. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Uh, and it's okay to be underwhelmed by, it, but I think it was a good signing. I think it was an upgrade. I think it was an upgrade for the Sacramento Kings. Not a massive upgrade. But given the direction of the franchise right now with an apparent emphasis on defense, I think it works. Uh, JH text, uh, tell me this will now mean the whole mecca of basketball crap will be dead and buried. No, JH, it absolutely won't be. Now, that conversation is going to continue because older people dominate sports radio. Older people dominate sports talk. And older people remember when the New York Knicks were good. And a lot of these companies are based on the east coast so they grew up Knicks fans and they want to hold on to that and they believe that the mecca of basketball is somehow Madison Square Garden because it's New York City it never will be to me New York City the Madison Square Garden is very nice now that it's been you know remodeled first time I went to Madison Square Garden it was a rat hotel it was disgusting it was it was worse than the old Arco the old Arco if you like if you ask players one of the biggest issues with Arc Arena wasn't necessarily what you saw. It wasn't nece- you know, the concourse was small and, and, and all of that, and seats were old, whatever. None of that was really a big deal. Like fans would always say, it's really not that bad. It's the stuff you don't see that's bad. It's the amenities for the players. It's the behind-the-scenes stuff. It's the locker room. It's all gross. That's the way New York used to be. Now, they did a massive remodel that stretched over a number of years that, that greatly fixed all of that. 
But the Mecca, not for me. Doesn't do anything for me. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. Again, we're, we're going to have an uncomfortable conversation sometime this week about the Western Conference. So start to put your thoughts together about where you think the Kings rank in terms of the Western Conference and where you think some of these other teams rank. What do you think about Dallas? What do you think about the moves that Utah has made? Uh, what do you think about Portland now that they've acquired Hassan Whiteside? They got Dame Lillard locked up long term. What do you think about them? What do you think about the Oklahoma City Thunder? They've been quiet this entire offseason. D'Angelo Russell, along with uh, Steph Curry there at Golden State. Andre Iguodala's on his way out. Klay Thompson is going to be out for the year. Kevin Durant's no longer there. What do you think about them now as they've won three titles in the last five years? They've been to five straight NBA finals. What do they look like? DeJounte Murray's coming back for San Antonio. San Antonio hasn't missed. There are people who are listening to this podcast who have not been alive in the Sacramento Kings making, uh, in the San Antonio Spurs not making the playoffs. There are people listening to this who have lived their entire lives during the stretch of, of the San Antonio Spurs playoff run. Are you willing to write them out of the playoffs now? You willing to say that they're, no, they're good. Nope, this is the year. This is the year they're out when they get arguably their best player, second best player back from injury. Remember, Jante Murray missed all of last year. We got to talk about these teams, man, and we got to talk about where the Sacramento Kings fit in this. But obviously, it feels like we're all on pause until Kawhi Leonard makes uh, his decision as to where he's going to play. And I don't know necessarily that we're going to get that today. I don't know when we're going to get that. But I'll have my phone in my hand. I'll be waiting for that alert from Woj or from Shams or from Sam Amick. Uh, and I'll be waiting for your text as well. Please keep them coming at 916-888-5898. If you're a subscriber, thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't rated the show yet, please do that. It split second, especially on Apple iTunes. Just hit the five-star review while you're there. Uh, also, if you have an extra minute or two, uh, leave us a review as we continue to climb up the charts of new podcasts there over on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for downloading and streaming. So much here to talk about. We'll get caught up on everything else in the world of sports and any new free agency news tomorrow here on the podcast with Damian Barling.